It's a real honor to be asked to speak to you. Um, a lot of my work has been with youth, uh, youth that get marginalized and racialized. And um, my number one answer for youth is school. And so you're really important to me. Our work is really tied together. No school uh, build more prisons. So um, it's really important that we're um, making these connections in the work that we do. Um, I really want to acknowledge the contributions of many activists and theorists, and like a lot of clients, survivors of torture and racialized folks, First Nations people that I did uh, residential school survivor circles with, who really informed a lot of what I think and what I do. So in a really profound way, this is a collaboration, and although I'm standing up here with my name on it, it's a hugely collaborative work. Um, I want to acknowledge also the skill and the wisdom in the room. I, I recognize many activists in the room, and I know that we have many, like a lot of skills and a lot of wisdom about being allies, so I hope this is going to be of use to you as well. I want to acknowledge also that we're on Indigenous land and that we're um, on the territory of the Musqueam Nation. Um, I'm not going to uh, offer any kind of critique. I want to um, be really respectful of First Nations folks responses to the apology, but as a settler person, I need to respond, I need to, respond to the federal apology to First Nations folks. Um, a couple of years ago, the Prime Minister apologized on the behalf of settler folks for the violence of residential schools. And um, especially given that we're talking about being allies, and that I supervise the Relief Crisis Center, I have really clear ideas about what an apology requires and what's not an apology. For me, as a settler person in this country, my Prime Minister, who apologized on my behalf, never asked me what I was sorry for, never asked me if I was sorry, never asked me if I understood what it was that he was saying I was sorry for, but mostly in terms of, for example, the work I do in violence, uh, men's violence against women. We wouldn't accept an apology from a man who said, I'm really sorry, honey, can we move on? We wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't, uh, no accountable man would say that. Men want to be accountable. People want to move forward. I want to move forward as a settler person. So for me, this apology let me off the hook, cleared my slate, and required me to do nothing. I didn't see groups of settler people meeting that day in tears with each other. You know, but I, I, I know other settler people share my discomfort and the shame of being apologized on behalf of when actually I didn't do any accountable thing. So that's kind of how we start our work as allies. Um, so this empty apology, uh, it serves to smooth over egregious harms, right? And to quiet dissent. And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about in terms of being an ally, addressing power, right? And being accountable to our locations of privilege. So all, social, all social justice organizing in Canada has to start from this place, from the territory of the line. Um, I'm packed up here, so I have no room for my stuff. So this is. This was an art installation around, around that apology. There have been similar apologies, you know, in Australia, New Zealand, Canada. It's, uh, there's been a spate of them, and they're all kind of acting to do some of the same things. But they are inviting some dialogue, like what we're doing today, so I'm encouraged by that. This work is presented from an anti-oppression and social justice frame, but that does not mean that it's either innocent or right, <laughs> or that it's safe, right? These are tricky conversations that we're getting into as soon as we start to talk about power. Um, so I'm going to invite you to just um, come on across the bridge and visit my stance for this work. Um, and just like listen and be part of this for about an hour. And um, think about a couple of things. One is, think about points where there's connections between us. What are the important points of connection between us? But I would also really invite you to hold on to where there's really important distinctions from us. We're not trying to, I'm not trying to create unity or tell people how they should think. So hold on to points of connection alongside the things that uh, don't fit at all for you. When we're done, you'll go back to your own uh, space, shake stuff up and see if any of this fits and if any of this is useful. When we talk about allies, we're talking about, in activist culture, an ally is a person who belongs to a group that has a particular privilege and who works alongside people from groups that are oppressed in relation to that privilege. The hope is to create change, increase social justice in relation to that oppression. That's pretty much what it is to be an ally. But one of the things that's changed because we've been informed by queer theory and other really progressive and post-structural theories is this idea that you know being an ally is not a static and solid thing. It's not like I act as an ally, I get my ally card, I'm one of the good guys and I'm good to go. 
and then if I behave badly, I lose it, and I'm not an ally anymore. It's more fluid than that, right? And um, Judith Butler, who I adore, is <laughs> a fabulous nurse. She wrote Gender Trouble. And um, some of the gifts from queer theory to allies are ideas that our identities are performative, fluid, and unstable. And what I mean by that is I'm not always an ally. Sometimes I need to have allies. Sometimes I act as an ally because I'm the person who has power in the, in the moment. But that it's fluid and it has a flow. Queer theory has brought many gifts to ally work, especially the idea that the ally is a performance, meaning it's something we do together across the differences of privilege that divide us. Queer theory frees us from taking on being an ally as a static identity, which could require being perfect and always getting it right. And we know that's not going to happen. We can't hold ourselves to that. Queer theory invites fluidity and movement from the fixed and the certain to the confused and the unstable. This is exciting for ally work because it acknowledges that we can all be allies to each other in a constant flow, depending on the context and our relationships to power. Fluidity means being an ally is not a developmental process. I'm always becoming an ally, right? And it also means, like, for example, in my work alongside queer, transgender, and two-spirit communities, I'm most often an ally to them because I'm heterosexual and I hold cisgender privilege. So I'm often the person with more power. But you know what? In a lot of some of the groups that I run, I'm a contractor, and my transgender friend, who's a man, is my boss. So when it comes to negotiating with the system, he's got to talk for me. I won't be listened to. I'm the casual pool. I work there eight hours a month. You know what that means? <laughs> Doesn't matter if I have a PhD. Doesn't matter if I'm straight. All of a sudden, I'm a casual person, and he's a manager. So there, he's got to be my ally, because he has more access to power, right? That's what I mean about the fluidity of it. So even in one conversation, I'm being an ally to him, and then he's being an ally to me. It's complicated work, but it's about um, really attending to all of those kind of intersections of where we have power. Categories that make up our identities, such as gender, class, sexual orientation, immigration status, these are useful, but they're also really problematic. Because I'm never just a heterosexual person. I'm never just a white person. I'm always Canadian-born, able-bodied, Irish Catholic, working class woman. I'm indivisible from the intersections of privilege and oppression that make up who I am. So ally positioning has always got to attend to this fluid intersectionality within the same moments, within the same conversations. The role of the ally is to address power and to try to contribute to the making of a space in which the person who is being oppressed gets to have their voice and their needs heard and listened to. And it's not enough to just be heard. A person's words have got to matter and they have to not be able to be dismissed, right? The ally helps to forge these spaces of justice alongside the person who's facing oppression. One of the things an ally is well suited to do is to resist backlash. Backlash is what happens when you speak truth to power. All kinds of people show up taking the power position to do things to say, no, no, power is going to stay just where it is. That's backlash. I was given a big workshop on um, accountability and understanding the oppressions of queer, trans, two-spirited folks. And uh, we were talking about homophobia, transphobia, heterosexual normativity. It was quite academic. Uh, at one point, a really privileged person in the room said, look, when are we going to talk about heterophobia, the way they hate us? You know? And everybody in the room who was queer, trans, and two-spirit was totally attacked by that, right? Totally attacked and unable to respond. And that's the role of the ally. I was able to respond because I was able to think and have my analysis because I wasn't being attacked by that. So I, you know, eventually the gay guy looked at the trans guy, looked at the... Uh, lesbian woman of color who looked at me saying, okay, you're, this is your guy? These are your people? You answer this one. <laughs> That's what it is to be an ally. It requires moral courage. It's not an easy thing to do. He was the most powerful person in the room. One of my bosses, I'm sure. Um, although we hadn't met. And, uh, you know, so I had to respond by saying, heterophobia and the way they hate us. Gangs of straight guys. Uh, gangs of gay men circling straight guys and beating them up and killing them. Gangs of lesbians raping women to cure them of their heterosexual orientation. I'm not seeing it, you know? We're talking about where the power is. When a, when a queer person is hateful to me as a straight person, it's prejudice. 
When I'm hateful to them, it's oppression because it's backed up by power. That's the kind of analysis we have to have. I didn't say all that to him. I said, you know what, we're actually not gonna talk about that today. That's like talking about women raping men at a workshop on doing something about men's violence against women. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, I'm saying we're not talking about it today. We'll get this one settled, then we'll talk about this. Right? Yeah. And the same is true when people talk about reverse racism. There is no reverse racism. There's racism and then there's prejudice. One is backed up by power. The power our prime minister tried to apologize away, right? It's real. Okay, so you get backlash. Collective accountability is what I'm after. When, I, when a person who's white, that's my brother or sister, does something that's racist, I am so seductive to tell you one of my best friends is black. Warren Williams, big guy, works in the school system, you might know him. I have black friends. I worked in Africa. Like, I immediately wanted to qualify myself as what? Not a racist, not that white person, right? That's the seduction. But I think what is required of us as allies is a collective accountability that's about accountability and not about my guilt about this. I need to see the white woman or man who did that as my brother or sister. I need to lean in and help them move forward. Whose job is it to do something about a racist attack? It's the job of the ally who holds that power, not the job of the person who's been oppressed. Their job is to survive the attack. My job is to do something about changing this, right? So I need to lean into that person. And I lean into that person, not because it's a good thing to do, because it's, I'm, I'm required to do that because of collective accountability. As a person with white skin privilege in this country, I, my, my status is elevated anytime a person of color's status is measured down. I know that I have white skin privilege. I know that it's really helped me in my life. And the, I think racism is kind of the perfect crime. I don't have to enact racism to benefit from it. My status gets elevated when racism is in place, right? So that's why the collective accountability is required. As allies, we're required to be accountable for more than our own personal, individual actions. We're required to be accountable collectively. Um, okay. When I'm talking to my brother or sister, I'm not gonna call them a racist. That's an identity attack on them. I don't know who they are. And I, even if I know them really close, people are more than the worst things they've ever done. You know, I was brought up in a really racist, homophobic culture. And so whenever I don't take a real stand to not uh, replicate oppression, I'm gonna do that. The water is invisible to the fish, right? So what I want to remind myself is what I'm trying to pay attention to is helping the person name their behaviors and the impacts and the harms of their words and their actions. It's not an identity attack on who they are as a person. Um, and I know that I'm going to get caught up in racism too and homophobia and other things. So what I need to say is what you said is racist. I'm not saying you're a racist. When we ad attack someone's identity, they shut down and get defensive. I'm a therapist, you know. I teach therapists how to do therapy. Sometimes when people are defensive, it's actually because they're being attacked. It's not always because their mother didn't breastfeed them long enough. Like, sometimes people respond to attack with defense, and it's interesting how we pathologize that. Defending yourself is, is not a bad thing if you're actually being attacked. So I don't want to attack my white brother. My God, you're a racist. My best friend is black. I'm so offended by what you said. That doesn't help a person of color. They don't want me to do that. They want me to say, hey, man, what you said, that was hurtful, right? Do you get that? That we can hear, right? Uh, there's a lot of cautions for us as allies. And I mean everybody in the room, because at some point, we're all allies to each other, right? Uh, holding an anti-oppression framework is fabulous. We were just talking about this. Uh, but theorizing is really limited. And despite the promise of critical theory, we have not delivered on a just society. What matters is that we enact our ethics. What matters is that we put this good thing into action and we do it. As allies, we learn on the backs of others, right? There's no innocent position. I acknowledge that most of what I've learned is from people from the global south and minoritized, racialized folks. They taught me at their cost and my benefit. And there's no innocent way around that, right? I acknowledge I'll never really fully get it despite an oppressed person's efforts to educate me on the realities of their lives. I want to stay humble, open to critique. I remind myself that when I am the person who's done oppression, and I have, people have needed allies against me. You know, I was in my office at the Rape Crisis Center and two women of color came to the door. 
And I was, this was a buddy just a year ago, and I, I said to myself, okay, Vic, here it is. If these two women have come together, then I'll never come. I'm like, this is a sign someone felt they needed back up against me, right? So I just exhaled and tried to stay open, and I said, okay, uh, it's Darla. I said, Darla, I want to let you know the fact that you got somebody else with you lets me know that you're probably scared about this conversation. I want to let you know I'm really open to hearing what you have to say, and I, you know, I want to be accountable to whatever's going on. Then we can have a conversation. Right? But what I'm saying is I'm not perfect and I don't always get it. I'm going to trip up. We're going to be imperfect. The point is to stay in the game, right? Yeah. The true privilege of being an ally is the idea that we can just decide not to. It gets too hard. I have to call my uncle on a rape joke. Not so sure. You know, now the stakes are up. You know? So the reality is we can be an ally. We can choose to be an ally, or we can choose to not hear it, not pay attention, not take it on. There's all kinds of ways we can abdicate our responsibilities as allies, right? And that makes it really hard to trust allies, because allies aren't required to stay there. It's something we have to stay with. So the other thing is that allies don't shoulder the burden. You know, one of the, one of the things a woman of color told me about an anti-racism workshop they were planning somewhere, she said, you guys come in, you do this good stuff, you leave. And then the next day I'm dealing with a bunch of people from the dominant culture who are feeling really guilty. And I gotta clean that mess up for the next couple of weeks and sometimes it goes sideways, right? So I like try to always hold that close as a caution. You know, acting as an ally can be really spiritually painful work. It's difficult, it's complicated, and it's often unsafe work. You know, where I have to, I have to call my brother on something, right? Um, and it takes moral courage. It takes moral courage. Um, however, the hardships of the position of the ally aren't the same as the person who's oppressed. The real harms are to the person who's suffering the oppression, the person who needs us as allies, right? It's, a, it's also a harsh thought that acting as an ally, even when you get it right, is never enough, right? or the end of our responsibility. It's a small piece of a larger response that's required, important, but never enough. Our collective goal is not to be good allies, right, but to change society so that everybody can experience justice, so that people don't need us as allies. Um, Leonard Peltier is an uh, American Indian movement leader who's been in prison in the United States longer than some people in the room have been alive. And um, he's uh, one of the, um, revered in activist culture and in indigenous struggles around the world where people hold him up for the sacrifice he had as an ally and just say, wow, this is the biggest sacrifice. And here's what Leonard says about this. He said, you must understand, I'm ordinary, painfully ordinary. This is not modest. This is fact. Maybe you're ordinary too. If so, I honor your ordinariness, your humanness, your spirituality. I hope you will honor mine. This ordinariness is our bond, you and I. We're ordinary, we're human. The Creator made us this way. Imperfect, inadequate, ordinary. And I hold on to that because as an ally, you know, I did good at math. It's got measurable outcomes. You get a mark at the end of the day. You know, you work hard, you can get it right. Ally work is not like that. When I screw up, it's painfully hard, and the person who suffered the consequences are the folks I'm trying to be an ally to. So I remind myself, even Leonard Peltier says, man, we're just ordinary, we're imperfect, let's just stay in the game with each other. Um, this is a story, oh, oh there's Leonard. Sorry, I didn't give you Leonard. Do something for Leonard, man. Uh, unmasking our privilege. I could also call this how I figured out I was rich. Like many people in this room, I'm sure. When I was at university, I did not experience myself as a very privileged person. I kept waiting for them to get the net and get that uh, person whose family doesn't have a history education right out of here. Um, like many of you in the room, I'm sure, I couldn't afford my textbooks. I had to work a lot of hours, so I couldn't go to all my classes. I had to pay for my own school. When I left, I owed a fortune, right? Uh, that wasn't true for most of the people who were in school at that time, and we know that this is getting worse as access to public education dwindles, right? So I, you know, Right out of university, I went to Africa to teach. I went with West World University Services of Canada. I imagine some people did this too. When I got to Africa, I was in Botswana in the Kalahari Desert. I don't know if you see me. I'm 160 pounds. I built for Canada. I wasn't built for the Kalahari Desert. I was walking through the desert. I was going to pass out. I was like, this is hot. Why didn't they send me to Kathmandu? Look at me. People, desert people don't look like me. I was really struggling. So it's my second day. I'm still jet lagged. 
I'm sunstroke. I'm a blotchy white girl. I am. Like, what am I doing here? Walking to school, trying to find a path through the cows. There's no sidewalks. It's all dirt. I am lost. If my degree is an outdoor rec. I can find a portage anywhere. I can't find the damn school. I'm feeling extremely <laughs> incompetent. And my degree is in poetry, Canadian poetry. <laughs> this doesn't help. And, uh, and I had an Iranian guy ask me if there's degrees in Canadian poetry. <laughs> We have 4,000 years of poetry. You got 130 years. Maybe degrees for this. I said, yeah, Mike, you're going to love this. My minor's in Canadian history. He just left. <laughs> you studied 130 years of history. That's fantastic. So I feel all these inadequacies are coming on. You know? And uh, this young boy stands in front of the row, blocks my half, and puts his hand out. He is wearing Chibuku containers for shoes. These are wax beer cartons. He has no shirt. And uh, it's time for school. He's not dressed for school because he's not going. There's school fees in Botswana. He's not going to primary school. I'm on my way to teach school. Puts his hand out and he says, Madam, where is my ten teddy? It means where's my nickel? And I have a Peace Corps roommate caught me up real quick. Now look, the kids are rude. They ask for money. Tell them Omakaka. It means they're rude. I said, oh, okay, okay. So he says, Madam, where's my ten teddy? I go, Omakaka, you are rude. I don't have ten teddy for you. <laughs> He, I keep walking. He walks ahead of me, stops me, puts his hand up, says, Madam, where is my 10 cent?" I said, I don't have 10 cents here. He said, Madam, you are rich. And what came right out of my mouth? Um, I just came from school. I'm not rich. I just felt a wave of shame as I said it. I knew in this context, this is wrong. I'm talking to a kid with no shoes who isn't going to get to primary school, and I'm feeling bad because I could pay for my university. And I've got this wave of shame that totally paralyzes me, and then this kid saves my butt and says, Madam, 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 you are rich. You're white. You speak English. You came here on a plane. When you're finished with us, you'll go home on a plane. You're rich. And I just thought, I started to look through my bag for 10 10. And I gave him 10 And I said, thanks, man. Thanks for the lesson I got. I went to school. He showed me what to do. I gave that kid 10 10 for the next four years that I lived there. I never paid him for what he taught me. That was the moment I became awake to my privilege. There's really good reasons I wasn't aware of it before. I was struggling. But uh, our, our privilege continually gets um, Hey, there's Don from Amnesty. Fabulous. Hi, Don. Uh, I'm continually be being open to my locations of privilege. This unfolding awareness has required me to respond in different ways and new ways to being an ally. I'm required to continually unveil more of my privilege. I did not know that I had gender privilege until recently. I'm 50. It was in my 40s that I figured out I had gender privilege. I saw the world in this gender binary of men and women. And when I look at the world as men and women, let me tell you, I don't come down on the power side. I experience myself as the potential and real victim of men's power and men's violence. But then, when some of my friends started to transition and are transgender, and I started to move in that community, it became obvious to me I have cisgender privilege. I have the privilege of being seen, read as a woman, my biology fits as a woman, and it's who I experience myself at. And that that's a massive site of privilege I didn't even know about until I was working with transgender activists, right? I had no, I thought I was doing a pretty good job on the anti-oppression thing. I had no idea about this. Um, and this is really exciting for us because it lets us know like, that we're going to continually learn more about ourselves and more ways we can be of use. The fact that I have cisgender privilege, the gender privilege I hold, means that I know, I know which public bathroom to go into. I'm not going to be questioned by other women, and I'm not going to be followed by security. And that once I get in there, I'm going to be safe enough in that bathroom. So these are the kind of things that continually become known to us. I think what we're all wondering about is, um, I want to hold my understandings of my location, of my privileges, really close, and reflect on my ethical stance for justice doing. I hold close a hopeful skepticism. It's very different than cynicism. It's hopeful, but it's skeptical, right? Am I walking the talk, right? Am I being an ally? Am I attending to power and being accountable to my privilege in this moment, right? Allies always resist neutrality. I'm a psychotherapist, so it's kind of bizarre. I am kind of lapsed and have had a bit of a struggle. Uh, therapists are told they should be objective and neutral. The work I do, 
This was survivors of torture, women who've been raped, and in the downtown east side with really marginalized people. I'm not neutral about torture. I'm actually against it. I'm not neutral about any oppression. And some of our professions require us to be neutral. And I can't do that as an ally, right? So we're, we're not neutral. And sometimes that takes some moral courage because we can get some backlash about that, right? But I need to be um, always resisting neutrality to take an activist stance. Activism teaches us that all oppressions are connected and we need to take oppressions on on all fronts, right? We know hate kills. This isn't just theoretical talk, right? Hate is not a metaphor. Queer and questioning youth are dying. Other youth are dying too, but I'm going to talk in particular just in this one domain for a moment. When I say questioning youth, I mean youth who think they might be queer, they might be trans. Other people may read them as queer when they don't experience that about themselves at all. Queer and questioning youth are two times as likely to think about suicide and three times as likely to attempt it. And transgender youth, 41% in one study, had attempted suicide. And we know that that number is artificially low because all the kids who actually killed themselves weren't part of that. These, this is a massacre. This, and what I think about this is we use the language of suicide. This is extremely unaccountable, violent language. Suicide is a criminal act. Talk about blaming the victim. These kids struggle so hard to stay on this planet. When they finally die, the name suicide criminalizes them and blames them for their death. These are murders. These are hate crimes, right? The blood is on the hands of everybody who enacts homophobia and hate and doesn't make spaces for these kids in the human family and on the world. So we really even have to take on our language at all times. But it's, of course, not just queer, trans, and questioning youth who are dying. First Nations kids are dying in heartbreaking numbers, entirely disproportionate to other folks in the population, right? We know that poverty, racism, and misogyny are killing our youth, right? This is why we have to be allies against hate, not because it's the right thing to do. Um, as allies, we try to respond to hate with an epic of belonging. The necessity of belonging cannot be overstated, as the risk of not belonging is death. Violence follows when hate is used to tell people they don't belong on the planet and there's no room for them. An epic of belonging requires that as allies, we create spaces of inclusion, right, across difference, and welcome everybody in. When we do this, we're enacting our solidarity. And when I say solidarity, the best example or description I've ever had of this, I was in Australia at an um, Aboriginal um, anti-uranium land rights claim action. They were going to, and they did, uh, mine uranium from Kakadu National Park. That would be like, you know, leveling Banff, right? Um, so this Aboriginal, there was a massive Aboriginal gathering, and I went uh, with many other, a couple other white actors. You know what happens, white people get moved to the front. There were a few of us. And uh, the elder who was starting the thing kind of looked at me and said, Wajula, which I took to mean white girl, which was right. <laughs> Look, um, if you're here to help me, you're wasting your time. Right? But you, if you've come here because your liberation is down to mine, then let us begin. Right? And many, many different folks have been credited with saying this. You know, if you're here to help me, if you're here to help me, you need to go. But if your liberation is tied to mine, you're welcome at my fire. Like, let's get started. Let's get our work on. That's what we mean by solidarity. I wasn't at that mine because I feel sorry for Aboriginal people or I like Kakadu Park. I actually never got there. Um, I was there because I live in unceded territory and I need to be accountable to that as a settler. And Australia's in the same bag. So that, that's my issue, right? I'm an anti-war activist, so uranium, I know what they want that uranium for. That's my issue. The survivors of torture I see are the guys on the end of those bullets. That's my issue. My life is tied to that. My liberation is tied to that. That's what we mean by solidarity. Um, you know, when we act as allies and we're in accord with our ethics for doing justice, we can experience these little moments of the social divine. You've all had these. Think about them. These are the moments of transcendence and hope, and they're profoundly uplifting. As allies, we create spaces of justice that are temporary expressions of the socially just society we're all working towards. These precious moments of the social divide tell us we're alive in our ethics, and we are the allies that we hope to be. So I'm going to tell you a little story from the 20 bus. Anybody here go on the 20 in East Van? Go through the downtown east side. Some people over there work down there. I work in the downtown east side a lot. I live in commercial drive, so I'm on the 20 a lot. This is, um, I tell all my therapy students, just go sit on that bus. You'll learn everything you need to know. 
figure out how to respond. This is where you're going to get your education. I get on the 20 bus late at night, and uh, like most women, I can tell you exactly how many drunk men are on the bus. But there's one drunk man who requires all of my attention because he's loud, he's standing up, and he's shouting racist things at an elder Chinese woman. He's at the back of the bus. I freeze, I'm paralyzed, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? The first thing I think about is, I can't take on a great big drunk man. I've tried this in my life. It hasn't worked for me, and I'm scared of great big drunk men. I'm not required as an ally to take on that guy unless I have the power to do it. I am required to be an ally to this woman. So what I did is I looked at the Chinese elder woman and I kind of threw my love at her. I want her to know I'm there, I'm with her. I'm going to try to figure out what I'm going to do. She's got her head down. She's got her groceries on the seat next to her and she's tucked in like this. She's not looking at my love that I'm throwing at her. This is a, this is a good tactic but not working, right? Uh, while I'm trying to figure out what the heck I'm going to do, a young, sweet, lovely person who I could not tell the gender of or anything slips by me keto style, and picks up the groceries, puts them on their lap, and sits next to her. What I saw as a full seat, this person saw as a seat without a person. Beautiful, eh? What a beautiful thing. So now there's a body between this Chinese woman and this man who's doing this racism against her, attacking her with racism. Um, the Chinese woman doesn't thank this person. I can tell this person's looking to say, should I put my arm around you? Should I talk to you? And the Chinese woman is letting her know, I'm not engaging with you either, right? There's a whole bunch of us on the bus and everybody's saying, okay, what's the next thing we should do? This guy's still going. Now I'm worried for this young person and I'm worried because my read on him is that they're possibly trans or queer and I think they're next. They're, you know, how should they be in front of this big angry guy? This is not good. There's a really large First Nations guy on the bus. I can't tell whether he's had a beer or it's performance art because he slips by the person next, he's by the window. He slips by the person by hand, puts his hand on the rail, like swings around. You know how to do that? Takes all the room in the bus. And in my head, I'm thinking, oh man, big guy stuff. There's big guy and big guy. This is bad. You know? I'm like, whoa. No, no, no. I totally mistrusted this guy. He's being a totally accountable man. What's he saying? Bring it on. Bring it over here. And he says to the guy with humor, hey man. Like one of the things the guy had said to the Chinese woman was, get back on the boat and go back to China. So when this First Nation guy says to the big angry guy, he says, hey man, you're the original boat person. Christopher Columbus was your captain. Get back in your own damn boat. And he's laughing as he says it. Everybody in the bus exhales because we know we're going to be okay. And then everybody leans in. And the guy looks at me because, you know, I, although I seem to have to, I am available. I'm trying to figure it out. He looks at me and goes, what the hell bus did you, or what boat did you come from? I said, Ireland, Newfie, little bit of England. He goes, you can stay. You know your boat. <laughs> he's holding court. He's holding, Sarah knows this guy. He's holding court, man. And he just like, so then this is all going down. And then I notice the Chinese woman picks up her groceries and slips out the door at the next stop. I go out with her. Right? The bus goes on. I don't get to see the, les uh, the rest of this lesson in 500 years of resistance and colonization, but I envision it, it makes me happy. Um, but I'm left on the sidewalk with the Chinese woman, and I'm wondering if she wants me to accompany her, if she's feeling safe enough to go to her home. She puts her head down and kind of runs, dragging a, her groceries behind her. She's probably not new to this. She's probably got really good reasons to not trust me either. I'm not a perfect ally to her. She doesn't welcome me and she doesn't thank me. She takes off. I'm okay, I realize, and I can't follow her, now I'd be a big, white person falling, so I let go. I want to be the perfect ally. She's saying, no, this is no. I work at a rape crisis center. We work really hard to hear no and listen to no. So it's like, Vicki, you have to hear no too. <laughs> so I, you know, I agree this is going to be imperfect. She's probably okay enough. Like I said, she's probably lived with this a lot. I turn around, there's three other women at the bus stop. And we're a real multiplicity of women. And one of them looks at me, looks at me else and said, this is nobody's stuff, is it? And went, no. It's like, man, we're all waiting for the next bus. <laughs> and that was my moment of the social divine, that four different women would get off at the wrong stop to accompany this woman who didn't even want us to walk her home and didn't thank us, right? And we need to, this is a beautiful moment when people do the right thing, right? And then there were a bunch of, because then I was thinking, oh man, now I'm a woman alone at night at the bus stop, I don't know, this isn't the 
best thing you've done, Vicki. But man, I got these other women in solidarity with me, right? And I know there's some accountable men on that bus. This changes things for me, it matters to me. I hold this moment of the social divine alongside the fact that this racism, this Chinese woman experience, that's the real story, and that's a heartbreaking story, right? When we talk about social justice, it's really impossible to define it. In my PhD dissertation, my advisor, who's my teacher, just kept saying, you haven't defined social justice. I'm like, I don't think anybody has. That's like, uh, that would be a PhD that would be undoable, but it's not what I'm doing. Um, when I, uh, what Noam Chomsky says is we can't define social justice, we can describe it, we can maybe smell it. We don't even have a language, we don't live in a socially just society. That's why we can't define it, we can't nail it down. We're still creating this thing. And that gets me really excited. Um, I think social justice is something we haven't even totally imagined yet, right? And as allies, our unfolding passion for social justice feeds our hope. And the moments we create as a social divine, they hold glimpses of this possible just future. You guys, for everything that you do, um, I want to let you know when I meet with people, I supervise the Drug and Alcohol Treatment Center for Youth. And when I ask these kids who are so exploited and demoralized and hurt how they're on the planet, I can't tell you how many times the person who is enacting an ethic of belonging, the person that is showing them revolutionary love is a teacher. A teacher who sees them in a different way than the rest of their life teaches them and it keeps people on the planet. And so my work is always shouldered up by your good work and you don't always hear back about how important the work you do is what is at the center of this is doing dignity. You do dignity with kids. That's not on your job description, it's the heart of your work. When you dignify those kids, I get to be of use to them because they know someone sees something in them that's worthy to keep them on the planet. So I want to honor all of the good work that you do.